welcome to the call sheet. Today's guest is Dean Goodon. He is a property master who's worked on such shows as Unforgiven, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford, and the TV series version of A Series of Unfortunate Events. Thank you for uh, joining us, Dean. How are you doing? Great, Matt. Thank you for having me on board. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about my career and my craft. Yeah. So the way I actually found out about you was because um, you had uh, written a book called They Don't Pay Me to Say No, which is um, a really strong statement, I think, of how one should behave on set. Um, how did you uh, how long have you been a prop master and, and how did you decide that you wanted to start writing a book about it? Oh, I've been a prop master now for 36 years, uh, probably 26 years in the Hollywood system. First 10 years were in the Canadian doing uh, commercials and smaller projects. And uh, as far as writing a book, that was an accident. I uh, would tell funny stories on Facebook because I decided about five years ago, I'd make my Facebook page just funny and educational. I didn't want to do politics. I didn't want to do any of the stuff that is going on sometimes. And so I decided to just tell short film stories. People kept saying, oh, you should write a book. And I thought, well, who wants to read a book by a prop master about props? Nobody knows where we even exist. There's no awards for props. Nobody really notices props unless they're bad or not there. So I, I thought about it a bit. And then one night I was working on a film, uh, The Unforgivable, with Sandra Bullock. And I came home one night. And to just take my brain out of the movie, I started writing the book. And then the pandemic hit and suddenly like all creative people, I needed something creative to do. <laughs> right. So I would get up every morning and and I just took all the stories I knew from my 36 year career and I laid them out in a trajectory of a book. And so that's how the book came about. I still wasn't sure I wanted to put it out, but that's the story of writing a book. So you say that not a lot of people know what uh, props is. So let's, let's actually start there because there, there are people in our audience who are green and i think most people have heard the term but what exactly is property or props well basically our department we put the action in the actor's hands so anything an actor moves and interacts with on a set is a prop it could as the simplest thing is weapons all weapons generally are props but it goes far beyond weapons it goes to if they're reading a book if they're reading a newspaper if that if that close up on that file on the desk with a photograph that turns the whole plot of the movie in a different direction, that's a prop. If there's a map that tells our heroes how to escape some perilous situation or in that map is a prop. Uh, if you watch a war movie, all the web gear, all the rifles, all the grenades, all the, all the different pieces that are moving in that scene, including the artillery is a prop. So basically everything we Everything an actor touches and moves 99% of the time is a prop. And the last thing that happens before a camera rolls is usually a prop being placed into an actor's hands before the camera rolls. We are the last people to touch an actor 99% of the time when the camera rolls. So what's, what's interesting about you said, what you just said there, there's, there's some overlap with other departments as well, right? So like a holster seems like it's something that you would wear, but it also seems like it has to relate to the gun, for for example. Um, do you, is that something you have to negotiate every time with who, whose job is it to get the holster? Or are there things that no. are really obvious like that? No, industry-wide, it's pretty much a standard now that, uh, for instance, the web gear on the military, any of the, any of the gun leather, if you're doing a Western, any sort of uh, FBI SWAT, all that Kevlar gear, all the external gear, that becomes a prop. But what we do is we sit down with costumes, we sit with the director, and we make sure that our tones are hitting their tones. So we don't want to sort of show up with something that's going to pop off the costume. So we make sure that everything ties into the look of the show. So we sit with the costume designer a lot, and we talk about what her color tones are, his color tones are. And then we make sure that we're in the same tonality as we're doing it. Uh, so that's how, how that works. With set deck, because we go onto a set and the set is decorated. The set is uh, is our function. Let's just say it's a restaurant. You walk into this beautiful restaurant that the art department have designed and created if it's on a stage and the set decoration department have created this wonderful world. 
Well, we're the people that bring it to life. We're the food, we're the dishware, we're the servers. All the movement that's happening through that restaurant with people and what they're doing, drinks, all of that. That's my department. So that's that's how you sort of break through. And so what we do with set deck is the same thing. I'll sit with the set decorator and we'll talk about what we're bringing to the table, right down to our napkins. Do our napkins work with the tablecloths? What the plate chargers are with the plates? It's really that nuanced. So, uh, so there's, there's all of these things have already been determined. There's, there's never a point where it's like we don't know. You, you have to negotiate with on this episode whether it's which department has to grab it. it you guys have unions have already settled all of those questions. It's not so much a union thing. I think that it's just been a standard in the industry forever. And there are gray areas. Sometimes, you know, we'll do eyeglasses and wedding rings and watches and whatnot. But the costume department will want to do fine jewelry or chains or anything that sort of augments that character. So we 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 talk it through so that there's no cracks, nothing falls through the cracks, but nobody says that's not me or that's you. We just have a standard that we we adhere to. We have to talk about it though, because some people do things slightly differently. So we just want to make sure that we're all covered. Nobody wants to get to set and look at the other person and go, I thought you were doing that. No, you uh, you said you started out mainly doing Canadian productions, and then now you do Hollywood productions that sort of come up to Canada. And also, uh, before we started re recording, you mentioned that your production designer on your latest uh, project was from New Zealand. So you've worked with people from all over the world. Are there different practices pending on you know uh, where where they are in the world, or is is IATSE really international in that way? IATSE is international. Uh, in Canada, we sometimes will end up in the British system. The British system, uh, for the most part, the prop master, sometimes they try to think that we work under the set decorating department, which doesn't happen when they land here. We are our own department. We do run our, our own thing. But pretty much it is, it when they land in Canada, our, our system in, in Western Canada, where I work, is the Hollywood system. It's how we learned. When I said I worked in mostly Canadian production in the first 10 years, I probably didn't phrase that right. I worked as an assistant on a number of American productions, mentoring under American prop masters, because movies would come to Canada and I would be one of the local guys hired to work with some of the great prop masters like Eddie Iona on Unforgiven or a gentleman named Ray Mercer on a John Frankenheimer film. So basically all the, all the Vancouver side and the Western Canada side work the Hollywood system. This is a system we all know. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, for people who don't know, LA and Vancouver are in the same time zone. And so it's, it's very convenient for the studios and, and stuff like that. Yeah, um, and us too. Yeah. Actually, I have, a, I have a question a little bit more about like the hierarchy and stuff, because from my perspective, I spent most of my time in, in the production office, and we always sort of regarded the art department as a whole. So like there was always there was set decorator and there's production designer and art director and props and even locations were, were often like in the same general like area. So as the prop master, you, you just said you don't answer to the set decorator. Do you answer to the production designer or is, or like, or do you only talk to the, uh, like, like what is the pyramid I, there? I under, yeah, I understand your question. And ultimately in the end, um, the director is the final say. I'm going to talk feature film because television structure is a little bit different with the showrunner structure and, and the director, but we'll just talk feature film. And so ultimately I show the design, production designer everything that I'm proposing for a show first, because they are ultimately the production designer. So I want to make sure anything I'm bringing into his or her sets is what they envision, even though it's being carried by somebody or the wait staff is walking through a frame with a with cut glassware or whatever. I want to make sure that I'm I'm in that wheelhouse with the designer but immediately i call a meeting with the director and we go through the script i go through all my questions with the director i want to make sure that i'm giving the director what he or she wants in front of that camera and i'll go back to the designer and i'll say listen what we think this should be the director wants this so then we kind of work together and if the designer has a real strong opinion about what is going on 
then we will go back to the director. It is kind of one of those, it's never an animosity uh, relationship. It's always, we all want the same thing. We want something great in front of the camera. We want to give the director what they want. So I technically am hired by the designer, but once the film starts filming, I spend pretty much all my time with the director. I go to the director with so many questions. I'm sure they get tired of seeing me. Now, um, a lot of departments have, they sort of have their people that are in their office and then they have an on-set representative, like the the set, there's an on-set decorator and then the set the actual set decorators is in the office, you know, getting ready for the next thing. Um, same with like wardrobe, there's an on-set wardrobe person that's not the costume designer. But with props, Correct. it seems like a lot of the time I see the prop master himself or herself on set. Why does why do why do you think that works that way? Well, on a feature film like television is a whole different animal. But on a feature film, because we generally can prep the movie if we have a long prep, and we know everything is going on, we generally my rule years ago is to try to go out the door with eighty percent of the show prepped and on the trucker trailer before that before we roll camera nowadays because everybody's writing the script as they go and the accounting complexities and the legal complexities have gotten so demanding on all department heads not just the prop master it is harder and harder now on a movie to stay on set all the time and take care of all the administrative roles that are happening um, compared to 10 years ago so to answer your question, every prop master wants to be on set. This is that's where we want to be. That's what we do. That's where we learn. That's but we also know now with the demands of the job that we may have to hand that over to a really strong on set person and be there on the big days. Any real complex days, you're there. You're there helping. You're right in the middle of it because if a problem comes up, you don't want the phone call. You want to be standing there to deal with it. But the, the job has changed significantly in the advent of the whole digital universe. I could give you a whole synopsis on digital accounting and legal, but it would probably be bleeped a lot. Now, the title of your book is They Don't Pay Me Enough to Say No. And I find that really funny because every pop master I've ever met, um, they always have, well, I guess you were just saying how you want to be 80% prepared, but every prop master I've ever met, they have so much stuff on their truck or in their office that is seemingly unrelated to the show and yet they're ready for everything how, how do you um how do you prepare for that day when the director asks for something crazy like like on the cover of your book the we need a cow on set <laughs> yeah i'll just quickly pop it up i mean the whole thing is what you do as a prop master is when you read the scene you put yourself in the scene and you not only read what's on the page, oh, so-and-so picks up a cup or does something. You actually think, what else could they ask for? What else could be in that world? What could be in that environment? So we're constantly, every prop master that's had a long career lays awake at night and thinks about everything that they could add to a scene. And so, yes, we usually have two and three backups of every plan. And the title of They Don't Pay Me to Say No is just a play on working in a gig economy early in my career. I learned early that if I say no too many times, nobody's gonna call me. So the reason I called the book They Don't Pay Me to Say No is just because I've operated under that thought process. But the reality is, yeah, my wife hates sending me shopping because I always come back. She'll go, why did you bring back three things instead of the one thing I asked you for? And I go, I'm just trained to not come back with one thing ever. You never come back with one. She goes, yeah, but we're just living our life. You're not on a film set. But it's just hard to take it away from me. Now, um, you're, you mentioned uh, earlier in the in our, in our pre-interview that your wife works in the film industry too. Um, out of curiosity, uh, like... Some people find that difficult because, because like you said, you're freelancing and you don't know your hours and stuff. How do you guys, not to get too personal, how do you guys manage that, uh, your um, uh, marriage while you guys are both, uh, you know, working on films and stuff? Yeah, that's a good question because, and I don't mind answering it because, um, because it is a difficult industry and I can only say what worked for us. We've been married now for 33 years. She's a set decorator. Uh, retired set decorator. She just awesome. recently retired, an Academy Award nominee, not to oh, wow. blow, blow her horn that way. But what we did was we realized about six years into our marriage that this career was totally encompassing. It was just crazy. And so we finally said, look, 
if we're going to survive this, we have to set a rule. So we had a key in the door rule when we came home, whether if we we're on the same hours, which was rarely, but you had 15 minutes to talk about film. That's it. After that, we have to be just Janice and Dean, normal human beings with everyday problems like everybody else. And so we, we did that. And then we made Sundays a no film zone. And so if we were having Sunday dinner or whatever, we couldn't talk about film, even if we were on the same show, because we were on a lot of the same. She decorated Unforgiven. That's the film she was uh, nominated for an Academy Award. Even though we were on the same film together, we did not talk about it when we had our day off. We really did try to put that balance in it. And that's how we ended up with a, a long, strong marriage. Wow, that's that's really good advice. Um also uh, deserved uh, an Oscar nomination for Unforgiven. That is um, an amazing movie, including the, the production and set decoration on that. Yeah. Um, so actually, uh, speaking of, of, of that movie, and you have, uh, if, if anyone wants to look at your IMDb page, it's, it's as long as my arm, and you've worked on a bunch of movies and TV shows. And uh, from what I've heard, Clint Eastwood is, is, is very prepared and he shows up on set and he shoots two takes and then moves on to the next setup. And there are other directors that are not. <laughs> and, um, I, I, from your perspective as as a prop master, how do you handle, um, I, I think sort of both ends of that. One is uh, uh, someone who says, this is what I want and that's what it is. And how do you handle somebody who can't make the decision until, you know, take three? Um, how, 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 do, how do you negotiate those two kinds of personalities? Well, first of all, working with Clint Eastwood, and uh, when you had mentioned a series of unfortunate events, the TV series, I worked with Barry Sonnenfeld, two directors who knew exactly what they wanted, and two directors who solved all their problems in prep. There were no problems on the filming floor because all the decisions were made in prep. Prep is the most valuable tool a film company can have. And over the years, people seem to think that they can carve away at the prep to get more days and shooting time. But then they get on the set and they can't solve their problems because they didn't solve it in prep. And so the key to a successful show uh, like Unforgiven or The Assassination of Jesse James, which is a cult film, or Open Range, which I did with Kevin Costner, they're all produced by a gentleman named David Valdez. And David just finished doing Dune 2 and Avatar 2. And he's just wow. a wonderful producer who believes in prep. And that's the whole key to a movie is you have to prep the movie, which takes me to part B of your question, which is dealing with directors who can't make a decision. Well, one thing of being a laid back personality that I am, the one thing I will do is I will force them into decisions long before the camera needs a decision. The worst place to make a decision is when the camera is pointing at something because every minute you stand there, the money is just siphoning out the door. So you have to, you have to have that answer at least 24 hours before. I mean, I had a thing this morning where I'm trying to get a decision about a prop that plays tomorrow. And I was there, I'm always there 24 hours before something has to see it because I don't want to show up on the day. I don't like surprises. I don't like surprising people. So with novice directors and directors who can't make a decision, I get the decision made because, uh, uh, you have to say because um, I, I get different answers from this depending on who I talk to. What would you say is an appropriate amount of prep? I guess like as a proportion to the shoot. If you have, if it's a twenty day shoot, how many days of prep would you want? And if it's you know a forty day shoot, how many days of prep would you want? Like what what, what do you think is a reasonable amount of prep? That's a that's a tricky one because all shows have different. Uh, you know, if you have a heavy manufacturing show. I'll, I'll use a series of unfortunate events where we created a world. Uh, I had 11 weeks prep. I mean, we shot for a year, but I had 11 weeks prep. And even then, it, we barely made it. I've been on other shows where I've had eight, nine weeks prep, but nobody would settle on the script. So suddenly you're down to the last two weeks before decisions are being made. Sometimes people use a long prep as an excuse to not make any decisions. And I, I find that extremely frustrating. In props, ideally on a feature film, I like to have eight weeks prep. I'll just say it. If I get anything beyond eight weeks prep, that's a bonus. But my average on feature films is eight weeks prep. And on streaming television, like Steve season one or a series of unfortunate events where you're building worlds, then I'm up to 11 weeks. Um, the show I'm currently on the last two weeks of a Disney plus streaming show that I can't say what it is. I've, I had 11 weeks prep. 
what's that like uh what's the difference for you between film and television because you you mentioned that like sort of the length of prep but because tv has multiple episodes you sort of have you're prepping one episode while you're shooting the current episode um how does that uh affect the way you do your job well i'm fortunate i mean i i have great respect for the people who who do network television that's that's an amazing group i can't work at that pace I, I think i'm i'm too much of a perfectionist i i entered into network television a few times and i have to admit it was i always felt i was five minutes away from failure because of the pace that you had to go eight day turnaround on an hour of television especially if it's high concept television and so i was i was like a deer in the headlights half the time because i was used to feature film pace and what happened is when streaming came online, uh, Netflix, uh, suddenly you were still working at a pace, but that eight day episode suddenly became a 17 or 18 day episode or a 20 day episode. And so you had a little bit more breathing room. And so as far as what, what happens in television is I will have two strong first assistants and I rotate them so that one is always in the meetings with me. They're with the director and prep. They understand what's going on so that they can take the props to set. They have the information. They still have me backing them up. But then suddenly I'm with my other onset prop master in all the meetings for the next episode. So I'm always juggling between two people rotating the show. Whereas on a feature film, it's me, my key on sets, and we don't rotate anybody. So that's kind of the difference is I rotate crew. So those those shows that you mentioned, like a series of unfortunate events, where you're creating an entire world um, from uh, I've I've never worked on a weird fantasy show like that, so I've only like seen the the marketing materials where there's uh, designers who are uh, where they do sort of uh, fantasy sketches, and then and then the next thing they they show you the actual like finished product. But you're the person who actually like has to build that prop that doesn't exist. So what is your relationship with the like concept designers and stuff? And then uh, how, do, how do you get something actually built that doesn't exist? Yeah, well, I'll use uh, I'll use a series of unfortunate events because uh, Bo Welch was the production designer on that show. The wonderful Bo Welch, just an incredible mind. And so the spyglass was a key prop of, of a series of unfortunate events amongst a hundred thousand other things. And so what I had to do is I got... I had a piece of concept art that Bo had already designed this with Barry Sonnenfeld. So I got it, but had no measurements or anything. So I had to go into a meeting. I had like a paper towel roll, a couple of toilet paper rolls taped together. And I held it up and said, look, I know I'm not inspiring any confidence right now, but I just want to know the size. Is this a good size? And they, they all laughed. I'm sure they were worried because it was the first prop I was building for them. And then I, what happens is I contact a wonderful a group of builders in Vancouver, I have multiple shops and, and these guys are amazing. And so I called them and sent them over the image. And then we, we ended up seeing, seeing it. it had 82 moving parts. It had its own alphabet and it just worked so perfectly. I remember when I handed it to Barry and Bo, they both said it's a piece of jewelry. It was the most coveted prop on the set. So basically what I do with the concept artists is if I have to create the prop, like the spyglass, for instance, was already drawn, but suddenly if we have to do, uh, we had this whole wacky uh, optometrist ch chair for Catherine O'Hara's character, and we had to we, we had to get concept art of what it was. And when it came time to build it, nobody was available to build it because they were building this big mill, all the fabricators. And I'm standing there. And I said, okay, I have to call a meeting. I said, well, everything has to hang off a six-foot steel ring. So I had a big six-foot steel ring. I had the concept art. And I called everybody and said, okay, how are we going to build this? And three weeks later, it looked exactly like the illustration on the set. It's amazing. Um, so actually, you, you uh, mentioned a couple of actors too. You said you're one of the last people to, to, to deal with the actor before they start rolling. Um, do, do you ever have to deal with getting approvals from the actors if it is something that's very personal to the character? And do you ever run into a situation where uh, like on the day, we, hey, we've already made this decision. This is what the prop is. And the actor decides that they don't like it. How do you handle, you know, that kind of? Influence? Well, again, it goes back to, yeah, that's good. I mean, it goes back to what I said earlier. I generally, prop masters are allowed access to the actors and prep. Oh, okay. So basically, as soon as the actors are signed, I'm on the phone with them. I'll give you an example on the assassination of Jesse James, Brad Pitt's 
revolvers. We had we knew through historical research what the serial numbers were on Jesse James' revolvers when they were found. We knew what wow. the engravings were inside the rings that Jesse James was wearing. We knew what the engraving was on the pocket watch. None of these were ever in the script. They were never referenced in the movie. But for Brad, his revolvers had the actual serial numbers of Jesse oh, James' revolvers. He had the engravings in the rings, and he had the foreign engraving on the watch from somebody that was that he got off a train robbery so we made all those things for him so yes uh, we're always talking to them in prep i do have a quick funny story about actors and please please the late christopher yeah so the late christopher Plummer. uh i was doing a little movie a little canadian movie and the assistant director came into my office and said mr Plummer would like you to call him about his props and so i'm like okay well i think about my questions and i've got the number and i I dial the number he's in, I think he was in Connecticut at the time. And he answers the his, I think his wife or somebody answered the phone very nice and said, Hello, my name is Dean Goodine. I'm the prop master on this movie. Guys, and Mr. Plummer had asked me to call. She's, oh, I'll get him for you. He got on the phone. He was so angry. He's like, How did you get this number? Why are you calling me? And I'm like, I'm like backtracking, going, I was told you wanted me to call you and he goes i think it's not my deal yet i don't know why you would have had this number and why you would have called me so i got up the phone i went down the hall and i sort of told i don't yell at people i just look right. at them and say well, what were you doing and so six months later i'm on a movie kevin costner open range ad watching the office goes robert duvall wants you to call him at home but his props well i immediately broke out into a cold sweat it was like are you sure about that? Who told you that? And I went down the hall and I interrogated everybody in the office with this like phone number in Virginia. Yeah. Uh, who got this? Who talked to these people? Like, is this for real? And I finally went up to a PA. I think it was her first job at a film school. And I said, do you know anything about Robert Duvall wanting me to call? And she goes, who's Robert Duvall? And I so <laughs> finally I realized, OK, it is legit. And so I, I swear I stared at that number for about half an hour before I got the courage to call him because I'm talking to, you know, Kil Lieutenant or Colonel Kilgore from Apocalypse Now and and Boo Rattle ran Boo Boo from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Like Robert's career was going through my mind. Right, right. And for the first the thing is, as a prop master, you have to turn your brain off to being a fan. I'm, I love movies and I love watching great actors, but when I talk to them, I have to talk to them like. I'm the prop master. I'm here to help you. So when I got Robert on the phone, there was a specific revolver in the script that was going to be a pain in the ass. And so I convinced Kevin to let me change it to something else. And Kevin said, well, if Robert agrees, then yeah, we'll change it. So I get Robert on the phone. I have to talk him out of a prop in the script. First thing I go, Robert, that revolver, I think it's going to be a pain in the shootout. Can we switch to this one? Robert goes, sure, that's fine. And then because I'd worked with Henry Bumstead on Unforgiven and Henry had designed To Kill a Mockingbird, for which he won an Oscar, we launched into the Robert Duvall career chat. Like I was allowed to be a fan with him. And then he was a fan of Western. So we talked for an over, over an hour. So when he came to set, we it was like we were old friends already. Well, that's awesome. So um, you have worked on a bunch of Westerns um, and, and uh, several of them are, are, are very much classics. Um, it makes me wonder when you were, uh, when you were talking about the restaurants and stuff, but also about like the weapons and things, sometimes those jobs have uh, their own, I guess, I, I guess my question is, are they sort of like a different department or a department under you? There, there, there would be weapons masters on some shows and on a smaller show, you might just have the prop guy who gets the guns. And same with like food, uh, there are circumstances where you have a food decorator and that's their job is if it's important to the plot. But sometimes I guess you just order food. So so um, do those people answer to you? Do they answer the production designer? Are you the one who hires them? Or how does all of that work? Sometimes, I guess. <laughs> I hire all of them. Oh, as wow. A prop master. If I hire if I, I all armors who come on a set, they work. They are hired by the prop master. I. I think ultimately on some big uh, war movies like Private Ryan and whatnot, I think there's a higher power involved in that. But generally the movies I've done, I've always hired, hired the armor. I've always hired the food stylists and uh, they all fall under my direction and my, my, uh, my leadership lack of a better term. So yes, they, they're all working with me. Uh, nobody works for me. They're all working with me. Yeah. <laughs>
you have, do you ever have to deal with that where uh, the food looks really good and you have to keep the crew away from <laughs> it? Uh, <laughs> not so much. Not the you know, there's a great, <laughs> no, there's a great there's a great respect for what we do. And, and so I don't have to really chase them away. Generally, at the end of the day, though, when uh, when there's lots of food left over, we if it's it been kept away from the set and just in refrigerators or I'll make sure that that crew gets to take it home. That's kind of my thing. If I have a really good food stylist in. I knew a, a prop guy who had a bunch of unlabeled bottles because you couldn't have actual alcohol served to the actors. So he would, he would get the product placement and they would pour it into a separate bottle and he would sort of pass them out to friends without, <laughs> without anybody knowing. Yeah, what we're, we're yeah, we're we're one of the few departments that are still allowed to purchase sinful things, but man, the paperwork you have to add to your accounting for buying that specific gin or vodka or whiskey and and uh you can't real you can't approach anybody about cigarettes anymore, but but we if we did have to get cigars and stuff, it's a whole it's a whole deal now in the in the uh motion picture. As a matter of fact, Disney, you're not allowed to have any any show of smoking at all do you ever work with uh so you, we, we've already talked about costumes and and, and sack back do you ever work with like makeup and stuff when you're doing um if there's gore or like i don't know like a needle in the arm like because that seems like it's props but it Absolutely. also seems like makeup um how did how, uh, yeah i know i yeah go ahead i work with special effects makeup a lot especially when it comes to bandaging, bandaging wounds and oh. uh, i've done World War One twice. I've done uh, Legends of the Fall. We did the World War One battle sequence. I worked on that, and I also did a Canadian film called Passion Hill, which was a World War One film. We did a hospital scene, and uh, to this day, doing those hospital scenes is still the most draining thing I think I've ever done. Because when you're in the middle of a scene, you, I take, I sort of put myself in that world mentally a little bit, and so I was trying to imagine what it would have really been like. And the makeup prosthetics in this hospital scene with the amputees and blood splurting and all of that. I mean, so we work together a lot. They come to me and they ask me what, you know, what I think the ballistics would be on a, on a wound. And, and then suddenly I found myself looking at rather distasteful things on the internet and researching. Yeah. And so, yeah, I work with them quite a bit. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, like I, I actually, you know, before this conversation, I swear, I didn't think I realized how much props works with everybody. Um, is there any department that you don't I, talk to? Like, I guess editing. Like, <laughs> no, I talk to editing because oh, really? at the end they'll say to me, "How many? How many shots? Uh, is that? Does that revolver hold? Or how many shots come out of that? Because they're editing around whether a clip empties or whether a, a cylinder empties. So they're always asking me so that they don't suddenly put in eight shots out of a six shot revolver. And so I, I do talk to them in post. And I, the interesting thing is, you're correct. And at the back of my book, I have a glossary of all the department heads pretty much on a film set and how we interact with them. Because oh, I thought people just don't know that we pretty much talk to everybody and we're involved with everybody on the filming floor. I, the closest departments I work with in reality, besides the director and the art department, would be stunts and special effects. Because with stunts, every fight sequence, whatever they have in their hands, that's a prop. So I have to be able to make fight safe props, whether swords, spears, javelins, uh, firearms, knives, anything that's a prop. Anything that they're using in a fight sequence is a prop. So I'm always with stunts. I'm always giving them proxies for training until I get the real things made. And then they usually bring it back to me a half day later broken and say, you know, <laughs> and say, we need to strengthen it here. And the other thing is you want to make sure that, A, it's got strength to hold up. But if you hit somebody, you're not going to hurt them. Right. So it's really a tricky thing. And with special effects, we're always giving them things to rig that has to go flying through the air or flying out of a hand or or whether there's a fire interaction with our prop. Or it's, 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 we even work with lighting. Any tracking lights, LEDs, any, like today is all about these stupid LEDs on set. I've done more LEDs in the last two years than I've done anything. I've learned more about lumens and lighting than I've learned about, you know, pretty much anything in props. So it's, it's, we are, we're in the middle of everything. 
What, why are LEDs? What, what does that have to do with props? I don't understand. Well, basically, if you have a, a sword and it's a fantasy sword and you want to track it and you have to do it, do anything with that sword, they want interactive lighting built in so that when they go to do the CGI effect, they have lights to follow. Or if you're doing, uh, yeah, it's basically if there's a prop and they have any interaction, they want us to put lights. It used to be the old days you put a red dot on it or an orange dot tape and stuff. Now they want LEDs. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, actually, that was going to be my yeah, next yeah. question because some people aren't clear. Special effects means actual practical effects on set. And visual mechanical, effects is the computer mechanical. stuff that comes later. Um, so you're also yeah. working with visual effects as well as special effects. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There, we're always, because we're working on the volume stage as well, we're scanning uh -huh. a lot of our props. Yeah. We, we sort of, we have to build them so that, that they don't sort of interfere with, with reflections and screens and whether they want reflections or no reflections. And so we're constantly working. We work with visual effects a lot. Now, um, going back to safety, um, there's a, a story in the news, um, unfortunately, of a tragedy that happened um, on an independent film set. Um, they did have an armor, but uh, they were not uh, doing their job properly, and um, someone was injured and someone was killed. Um, now, I obviously, this would never have happened on one of your sets, um, but if you were, for, for our viewers who are on set and don't have a lot of experience, what should they see the either the armorer or the prop master doing that lets them know you know because a pa who's watching this isn't um going to be able to like do anything but they should at least be aware of what the, the the proper procedure is so that they know this this person is behaving safely what should what should be happening every time a gun comes up on set whether it's a prop or a real gun with fake bullets or or whatever um, I'm using the terminology wrong, by the way, I'm sure. So please correct me on good. that as well. It's yeah. all good. I totally, uh, you know, I don't think your terminology is completely wrong. I think your terminology is fine in the sort of the layman terms. What I'll say is I have five steps. Your PAs and the people on set will only see steps three, four, and five if they're near the camera and the filming floor. But basically all prop masters or armors, I've done both but I'm also smart enough as a prop master now that I always bring in an armor when there's a firearm out, because as you heard before, we are dealing with 99% of the crew all the time. So I want somebody whose focus is just the firearm. But when I'm doing a movie like Open Range or Jesse James, where I ended up doing a lot of the armoring, here's the process, simple. I pull the weapon that's needed on the set out of my vault. The first thing I do is I inspect it. I inspect it. Barrel's empty, everything's empty, it's completely clear, it's completely safe. The next thing I do is, oh, if I have to put dummy bullets in it, then I will inspect I inspect all my ammo. Like I each then load individual bullet? Each each individual, I look at every blank and I look at every dummy round. And there's there's so what is the difference ways... between that between a dummy and a and, okay. a, and a blank? Because I honestly don't know. Yeah. So so basically a dummy bullet looks like a real bullet. But there are three ways to make it safe. One is the primers have already been struck, but they still have a marble in them. So you go, you hear the rattle, you hold it up to your ear and you hear a marble going back and forth. You know, there's no powder. The primer has been struck. So it's inert. If you have a dummy that has to look like it hasn't been shot and you're doing a loading sequence on a close up, then you have a primer that is not struck, but you still have the rattler in there. So you always rattle it. It looks like a real bullet. You would never be able to tell unless you picked it up and went like that. And you could hear the rattler. And if you don't hear a rattler, then you don't use that dummy. You just don't do it. The third one is if, if nobody needs to see anything other than the, the shell heads in the I'm talking Western revolver, right. then you can have nope, you can have no primer. You can have a drilled out side. And basically there's nothing there oh. that will fire. So those are the sort of the three things you're looking for when you're loading a. a so if we see bullet. a prop guy going like this with a bullet, it's not a weird. He's not talking to it or something. It's <laughs> he's being. No, safe. he's not. He's not. He's not crazy. He's he's checking for a rattler. Right. So step two, that's me checking all everything. Then I take everything, put it in my lock, my set cart, and I lock it. Roll it up to set. Here's where your PA. Here's where your on set crew 
watching the prop master of the armor arriving with the firearm or firearms. There could be multiple armors, but I'll keep it the one because whatever section you're in, there's somebody. I open the cart. I put in the appropriate dummies. I even check them one more time. Then what I do is I actually cycle those through. I fire, I drop the hammer on that revolver seven times. Six shot revolver, but I'll cycle it through seven times. Then I will go up to the first assistant director and I'll go, okay, here we go. I open it up and I show him all the primers are struck. That And then I will cycle it through seven times for that person. Then I will call the camera crew over. If they're not there with the AD, I'll call the camera crew over and anybody who wants to look and I'll cycle that revolver one more time again. That's what and I then remember. When the actor the, arrives. The first time I was yeah, ever on a, on, the first time I was ever on a movie with a gun, I remember the uh, prop guy calling everybody over and says, "For anybody who wants to see." And I was like, "What would that be for?" And I, I did. It was, it was. Yeah. I had never heard of a real tragedy happening. I never. It seemed pointless to me. Yeah. It's only when something bad like this happens that I realize it's Absolutely. good that he made that offer to everyone who wanted yeah. to see it. Absolutely. And, and so then once everybody's seen it, the actors arrive, I do the same thing that everybody's just seen. The actor now gets that so that if in the type of scene you're doing, he has to have that revolver out. And a lot of times people go, oh, they should use a rubber gun and this and that. A lot of times actors like to feel the weight of a real revolver, especially if they have to draw it on camera, they want the real, real weight. So you can leave the dummies out, whatever. There are just so many steps, but there are five fundamental steps that you follow to put that revolver. And the other thing is nobody, absolutely nobody is allowed to touch a firearm on a set other than armor, prop master, representatives of either of those departments, either armor assistants or prop assistants that are assigned to specific weapons and the actor. No other hands touch that weapon ever. It goes literally from my, I'm going to put myself there. It goes from my hand. Once everybody's ready, everything's safe into the actor's hands. We do what we need to do. And then I take it back from the actor. Nobody, no ADs, no director, no, you know, somebody down the corner the, that wants to touch it. The location guy, hey, I've, I had guns shooting gophers. Can I, can I hold your gun? No, nobody touches it ever. And so explaining that, reading the hearing in the media, everybody can make their own assumptions as to what went wrong. So basically nobody did anything. That's what went wrong. And the wrong person handed the firearm in. I, it sounds like every single step was was skipped or or done incorrectly. Um and I wasn't there and I, I don't want to um say you know anything, but uh charges have been filed. Um and yeah. I would I would also say so um for the for any actors who happen to be watching this it would be although they don't know what a primer looks like they shouldn't accept the gun from anybody but the prop master or the armorer right like the uh for the for the reasons that you're explaining correct i mean nobody nobody other than those two and and the person that's handing the firearm to an actor will show them everything they need to know that it is safe. And there are no questions that are dumb questions. There, You can't show a firearm enough to show that it's safe. So what will happen after day one or day two on a set is they start getting comfortable with you. But I still don't let that be a reason to not go through the process. I had, I've had a couple actors going, why are you showing me this again? You just showed it to me five minutes ago. And I go, it was out of your sight. So you right. need to know. You, you know, you just need to know. Trust me, you need to know. And uh, yeah, it's tragic. We we have all these steps. Hollywood invented safe firearms on set. In Canada, we have a system that is the Hollywood system that is flawless. It's flawless. I've put over 2 million rounds through my firearms in my career with no hiccups, no worries. I mean, yes, you have the odd misfire when you're loading, but it's so rare. But nobody's ever in the firing line when you, when it happens, right. but you know, it's just, it's just sad, really. It's so tragic and unnecessary. Now that's talking about uh, dummy rounds that aren't actually going to be firing and they just need to look good on camera. Um, but blanks are slightly different because they, they make a sound and they, they do make a flash. Um, 
do you think blank so so you 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 think rubber guns aren't necessarily a good substitute because the actor needs to feel the weight of a heavy gun or whatever do you think in this day and age when it's pretty easy to add a muzzle flash in cgi do you think um blanks are obsolete or do you think there's still a purpose to those and then in terms of safety if you are using them what's the difference I think it's always situational. We've been using CGI muscle flash for the best part of the last decade when uh, when we get into situations that we feel aren't safe. I think that when you have world-class armors on your set, they can make that call as to, I don't think we can make the shot safe, so let's just CGI and move on. The, the tricky thing is the, um, I do a lot of historical things. So a lot of times good replicas of historical firearms are not available. I'll use All Quiet on the Western Front as an example. The Academy Award nominated film that just uh, just came out on Netflix not too long ago. I also have done World War I three times with those weapons. You can't actually go buy those replica weapons. A lot of times you can do CGI muzzle flash in the trenches, but when I was doing my World War I things, nobody was ever in front of the muzzles, so you could actually fire the blank rounds there. So it's just always, you just need to make sure you hire professionals and we can tell you whether it's safe or not. I know there's a big call to ban firearms and, and all of this. And I, I understand, I completely understand. But on the other side of the coin, for 130 years, we've been doing it this way. And yes, one death is too many. And we've had, a, we've had three uh, with Brandon Lee, John Eric Hexham, and now sadly Helena Hutchins and but the reality is every one of those events, they didn't have the right personnel on set taking care of the firearm. And well, there's a professional top world-class industry that is designed to do this safely. Well, in, in the case of the crow, it was also a bit of a, a freak accident that something got lodged in the in the barrel that shouldn't have been there. And and now my, my understanding is that it's standard practice to open the barrel and shine a, a light through it just in case now for it the was last 30 actually years even so. yeah but but even before that that was standard practice again oh they sent i the see armors. they skipped they missed yeah the that wasn't oh, they okay. sent the armors home they didn't have proper dummy rounds so the, you know they went to the local gun shop and somebody dumped the powder out and put the head of the bullet back on for a loading sequence the primers were still live and what happens when you have a live primer uh that it there used to be a way that they would just boil the primers to make them inert but it wasn't a foolproof system. And so when the primer struck, it shoved, it pushed the barrel up in, or the bullet head into the barrel. And then nobody, when they took the bullets out, nobody noticed that one of the heads was missing. They put it back in the drawer for 24 hours. They came in the next day. Again, the armor weren't there. They only had a full load blank available to them. Put that in. There was a bullet in the barrel. And when they pulled the trigger, a lot of times a full load blank will have a little bit more powder in it than a than a bullet. So it, that's a lot of bad mistakes were made again uh, by inexperienced, incompetent people. It's just that back then there was not as much internet and coverage. So and uh, so yeah, there was. You mentioned a third one. The the Brandon Lee one is fairly famous, and the Alec Baldwin one is now being talked about. What's yeah, the, John what Eric Hexham. Yeah, John Eric Hexham, I don't know the exact year. It was in the early 80s. He was a star of a TV show, and there was a prop gun on a table that was loaded uh, with blanks, and he picked it up jokingly and put it to his uh, to his head. And the, the power of a full load blank is it will blow a hole this big through yellow pages about this thick. And so he fractured his skull and was killed with the blank. Oh. And that gun should not have been available to pick should up not have been should not have been available to pick up with blanks in it at the table like oh. you know i can't i wasn't there so i can't speak to right. what the consequences were but but yeah we don't we don't load blanks into a firearm until just before the camera is going to roll we stand there with with the ad's and everybody and once we know then we'll make the weapon hot we wait for everybody to put on their safety gear. We make sure all the Lexans up to protect the camera crew. Everybody is safe and protected. And when the camera rolls, the actor still doesn't have the, the firearm in their hand until we say, they say uh, uh, camera roll, and then we'll step in and go weapon is hot, four rounds, full load, whatever. And they call the shot. We do the take. We go in and take the weapon away when they say cut. 
Nobody takes off their safety gear. Nobody, everybody freezes until we make sure the weapon is clear. And then we say, weapon is clear. And everybody can take their earphones off and, and be safe. That That's super helpful for um, anyone who is never, if you're either new or never been on a show with, with, with weapons, it, it's, this is super helpful to learn what is, what you should be looking out for. Um, and, and, most of the shows that I've ever worked on um, that had that had weapons like that, everybody behaved that way. Um, I think the the rust situation is a outlier. Um, it's not it's not the norm. Um, and you've been in the business for for such a long time. You know, obviously, that it's not. Um, it, it's more, uh, which is why I think your your book is great because it, there's not any tragedies <laughs> in the book. It's more the 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 fun things that are happening on set. Um, so what, for, for anyone who hasn't, uh, who's not sure about buying the book, so tell us one of your, one of your stories from, from, they don't pay me to say no, uh, that would, uh, whet their appetite to go and to the bookstore or the library and pick it up. Well, thank you. I think that, as you said, uh, the book is actually a, a book of short stories type of book you can pick up and put down. You don't have to read it linear, even though it follows my career trajectory. And there's a lot of humor because I'm from the East Coast of Canada, which is kind of like the Irish. So we kind of believe in in keeping things light. And I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted them to learn. And I wanted them to learn about safety, but I also wanted them to laugh. And you asked me earlier, Matt, about how my marriage survived so long in this industry. Well, I almost ended it one day. I was on a set. It was a wagon train movie. I had been convinced I got convinced after Legends of the Fall to uh to do this little TV movie. I didn't even ask what the script was. My friend said, oh, I need you to come and do this movie. It's really simple. It's just before Christmas. Uh, and I thought, oh, I'll make a few more weeks of money. And the movie is about the Donner Party. Now, if anybody who's in American history knows the Donner Party, they were a group of, of settlers who got trapped in the Sierra and Nevada mountains in the late 1840s and this huge blizzard and had to resort to cannibalism. So I thought, well, this isn't the feel-good Christmas movie I signed up for. So anyway, we're on the trail of the wagon train. The director came up to me and he said, hey, Dean, can you uh, can you get a small roast? We've been doing stews and stuff. And he said, can you get a small roast for tomorrow? We want to kind of show that this is the last solid chunk of meat that they have left before they go into this mountain pass. So I, this is before cell phones. I'm out in the wilderness and I go to the AD trailer and we had a trunk radio called the office. Trunk radio for anybody who doesn't know. It's a long range radio. I get somebody on the office scraggly and I go, can you have Jan have her buyer go buy me uh, three to five pound roast and throw it in the oven tonight? Cause I was on a, my wife was on days and I was on split. So it meant I would wrap at 1 AM. So I get home at 2 AM and I walk in and Jan and I would leave notes on the fridge for each other because she was on days and I was on nights. So it was usually like, miss you, love you, all that. And this wasn't a miss you love you. It was your effing roast is in the is in the studio. And at the time, our house had a little studio on the side. And I thought, man, that she doesn't swear. Why would why would she say that? And I go in, I look in the studio, I'm looking around, trying to find this little roast. And I look, and there's this giant mound of tin foil. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, what is that? And I lifted it. It was a 35 pound roast. She had her she had her buyer go to some meat packing plant, and they frank and roast. They Frankenstein this bunch of meat together to make a 35 pound roast. And I'm standing there staring at it like, what am I going to do with this? And uh, so anyway, I go upstairs. I'm thinking, well, I'm lucky because sleeping wives, you know, she'll be asleep. <laughs> but I forgot that actually angry wives don't sleep. They have one <laughs> eye open waiting for you to come in the door. And I got that. Have you lost your mind? I'm going, it was a three pound, three to five pound roast, not a 35 pound roast. So the next day I cut the piece off. I needed to went up to cater with a giant garbage bag <laughs> roast and said, Hey, do you think you can use this for anything? And the caterer looked at me and said, where did you get that? And I said, whatever you do, don't ask Janice, please don't mention it to her. And then they served us chili for the next two days, which is like the worst food to serve a large group of people in very small spaces. So uh, anyway, that's the Franken roast. Lots of stories like that through the book. Um, I, you know, I wanted to have people laugh more than than not and also like i said learn it's it's quite a journey it's been a 37 
your journey has been a lot of fun and uh, the book's gotten really good responses out of Hollywood and around the world. So it's been really a treat. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm looking forward to reading it. I couldn't get my hands on it sooner. Um, I, I have one more question for, uh, I have one more question for you. Um, for anyone who is interested in getting into props, someone, a film student or somebody who's just a couple of years, you know, into the industry, um, besides buying your book, what what sort of advice would you have somebody who's starting out now in, in 2023? Well, I think in, you know, I'll use Los Angeles as an example. I think you look around, uh, you want to start, if you're in film school, you know, you're making your your films now and and you look and see who are the the prop masters that are really sought after and that are working. You want to know who the people are that you want to aspire to work with or be with. And you just figure out, you have to be tenacious. Props is uh, it's a department where nothing is the same every day. You have to have a pretty uh, grounded personality because you're going to get asked to do something that you never thought you would or you thought you were prepared and they're going to change it on you. So I think that, um, you know, just... Looking at who is doing it in the industry, looking at local 44 in Los Angeles or looking around North America or Canada at the various unions, find out who the top prop people, top, sorry, top prop people are. Find out if there's any training available, what's going on, how can you get in the craft. I'm a member of the Property Masters Guild. It's a new formed group based out of Los Angeles, and their goal is to mentor young prop masters. And so it's really on its beginning, but the people that are leading it have had, like if you name a, an Academy Award winning film, they've all done them. It's like, I sit in awe of these people and they're all super nice and they want the same thing I do. They want our, our department to grow. We want recognition. We want people to understand just how important our craft is. The rush tragedy has rocked us to our core. It's, it's, been you know i think all of us are are still suffering a bit from it all of us have replayed every gunshot we've done so for a young prop person aspiring prop person it's a wonderful craft it's a wonderful job if you like challenges if you like learning if you like history this is the place for you well awesome thank you very much for coming on our show and i hope anyone who is uh concerned about safety um, can feel better knowing that uh, Russ was an exception to the rule and not the way normal things are. So thank you for helping us out and thank you for um, being on the show. Thank you, Matthew. Real joy. Really enjoyed it. Take care.